Welcome to St. Thomas Methodist Church in Plettenberg Bay. The message is brought to you by Rev. Timothy Rist. Friends, good morning and welcome. Uh, today's service is very quiet in some ways, very reflective, very meditative, because it's a service for healing. Why the service today? Why the shift? Why the change? When I was preparing during the week, I felt it would be so abrasive of us. It would be wrong for us to simply go into this week so filled with the rejoicing of the resurrection that we have forgotten there are five families grieving. Because in our week of Easter, five families from our church lost loved ones. In fact, this morning, friends, and I invite you to join with me at half past 11 here in church. You might remember, I'm sure you do, Gerard, the man from the shelter would sit on my left-hand side down the bottom here. And he'd come in the first service to have communion and then stay for the second to worship with us. He died suddenly during our Easter week. And I'm determined that he is not forgotten, that he must be remembered. So at half past 11, we're going to remember him and others who have died. All right? And so this is all about healing this morning. It's about saying we understand the resurrection power. We rejoice in the new life that the empty tomb brings. And we say, thank you, Jesus, for that gift. But we understand we do that in the context of healing this morning. We don't like the one song uh, that jars for me, but we have to sing it. You give and take away. You give and take away. As if the taking is a cruel act. We don't mean it that way. Scripture says, I come and when the time is right, I will take you to be with myself, said Jesus. So we love the giving part, but not so much the taking. And it's in those taking moments, those broken moments, those pain-filled moments where we need to pause and say, God with us, be God in us and lead us to healing. So a service for healing this morning. And so if you long for a new life, if you long to let go of what was and breathe in the new, then the service is for you this morning. If you are one who is in grief for whatever reason you are grieving, then the invitation is to you to come and receive healing. If you are grieving because others that you know and you love and care for are grieving, then this time is for you. If you are saying, Father, I understand there's no other way to heal our broken community or to heal our broken land or to heal our broken world but you, there's no other way but you, then this service is for you. If you're saying, Father, we need a new hope, I need a new hope, a new perspective, then I invite you to worship with me this morning because the service is for you. And so friends, prayers will come up on the screen. And if you're not used to this particular way of worshiping, two things. The prayers come up on the screen so hard of hearing can participate. And the prayers come up on the screen because when we speak words out loud together, some, somehow we are more focused and the prayer becomes real. It becomes my prayer, not just your prayer prayed over me, right? So make these prayers yours. And so here's our call to worship and praise. But before we get there, just a, a Bible verse I want to remind you of from Matthew chapter 11, from verse 28, where Jesus said this to those that were there. He said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And so the words on the screen now. This is a place of safety. 
This is a time of comfort. Here and now, the God who made the universe waits to embrace us. Here and now, we come to feel God's healing touch again. With all that we are, parts that are whole and parts that are broken, parts that are well and parts that are sick, parts that are joyful and parts that are in pain. With all that we are, we come to worship you, O God. For you are gracious, merciful, and kind, and we long to find our rest in you. And so in our prayer of confession, where we engage with God a little further, let us open our lives to God's searching gaze now. Dear God of mercy and compassion, we acknowledge that we are not all that we would like to be. We carry wounds and regrets, some of which are of our own design, and some of which we have received from others. We acknowledge our failings, our bitternesses, and our hatreds, and ask you to heal us. So we continue now, Father, Father of all our sin, forgive us, O God. In all our weakness, strengthen us, O God. From all our diseases, heal us, O God. In our statement of faith, we say this. We believe in God, the creator of all that we see and all that we do not see. We believe in Jesus Christ, God become flesh, in death the forgiver of sinners, in rising the healer of the broken. We believe in the Holy Spirit, God within us, Comforter, strengthener, and friend. Amen. But what I'd like to do now is read to you from Isaiah 61, some selected verses from the chapter. Bear in mind that Christmas song, Come Thy Long Expected Jesus. Bring that to mind now as we read this passage. The heading is the year when the Lord sets his people free. The Spirit of the Lord and King is on me. The Lord has anointed me, anointed me to announce good news to poor people. He has sent me to comfort those whose hearts have been broken. He has sent me to announce freedom for those who have been captured. He wants me to set prisoners free from their dark cells. He has sent me to announce the year when he will set his people free. He wants me to announce the day when he will pay his enemies back. Our God has sent me to comfort all those who are sad. He wants me to help those in Zion who are filled with sorrow. I will put beautiful crowns on their heads in place of ashes. I will anoint them with olive oil to give them joy instead of sorrow. I will give them a spirit of praise in, a, in place of a spirit of sadness. They will be like oak trees that are strong and straight. The Lord himself will plant them in the land. That will show how glorious he is. The Lord says, I love those who do what is right. 
I hate it when people steal and do other sinful things. So I will be faithful to my people and I will bless them. I will make a covenant with them that will last forever. Their children after them will be famous among the nations. Their families will be praised by people everywhere. All those who see them will agree that I have blessed them. The people of Jerusalem will say, we take great delight in the Lord. We are joyful because we belong to our God. He has dressed us with salvation as if it were our clothes. He has put robes of godliness on us. We are like a groom who is dressed up for his wedding. We are like a bride who decorates herself with her jewels. The soil makes the young plant come up. A garden causes seeds to grow. In the same way, the Lord and King will make godliness grow. And all the nations will praise him. Amen. Friends, as I said to you at the outset, the service is quite reflective this morning. So the theme is comfort for the brokenhearted. And uh, Jane sources the images for me. She puts the slides together for each service, for anyone who speaks here. And I think there was a particular anointing in finding this wood carving. Uh, and it's a wood carving from a lady, an artist, who lived in Germany during the Second World War. And you would know how dangerous it was for artists during that time. And the carving is of one person grieving, comforting another who's grieving. Very powerful. Comfort for the brokenhearted. Now, you might have recognized that Isaiah reading when I gave you the hint around Christmas as being the words that Jesus himself used in the synagogue when Jesus was getting ready to explode into the world in his ministry. Remember the stories? He's been baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan. He's spent his time fasting and praying in the desert. He's been out there in the wild place, getting focused, getting ready for this ministry that he knows the Holy Spirit will launch him, launch him into. He's come from that back, as the, this reading will tell us, into his home territory, his hometown. They know him and he knows them. And in that synagogue he's worshipped at so many times before. This is what happens. Luke chapter 4. The heading, Jesus is not accepted in Nazareth. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Holy Spirit. News about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues and everyone praised him. Jesus went to Nazareth where he had been brought up. On the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue as he usually did. He stood up to read, and the scroll of Isaiah the prophet was handed to him. Jesus unrolled it and found the right place. There it is written. The Spirit of the Lord is on me. He has anointed me to announce the good news to poor people. He has sent me to announce freedom for prisoners. He has sent me so that the blind will see again. He wants me to set free those who are treated badly. And he has sent me to announce the year when he will set his people free. And that's a direct quote paraphrased, obviously, from Isaiah 61 that we read earlier. Then Jesus rolled up the scroll. He gave it back to the attendant, and he sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were staring at him. He began by saying to them, Today, this passage of Scripture is coming true 
as you listen. Today, in other words, I am the one Isaiah speaks of. And I, from this hometown, am here to tell you today it begins. Wow. Now, friends, Isaiah is written in two sections. And I need to tell you this so that you can understand why this particular reading we've just had is so important. There are two sections to Isaiah. The first section has what we, got, we call in our biblical studies, in our theology, the book of judgment. And what was the book of judgment about? It's a whole lot of chapters. It's when things were going well for the, the, the Hebrews, for the Israelites, and they were being blessed, and they, they were living it up, and it, oh, life seemed so good. And Isaiah was saying as a prophet, you are moving away from God. You're moving further and further away from God. God does not like what he sees. You need to make sure you come back to God. So he's trying to urge that the people return to God in the right way. Make sure he is saying that God is the focus of your faith. That God is the one that you focus on in the way that you live your life. If you do not do that and keep God in the center of, of your faith, you are going to lose everything. And so the words of judgment, go and read those chapters. They are quite harsh, and they are blunt, and they are direct. Ah, and then what happens? They are invaded, and the people are taken into exile. And so the second section, where today's reading comes from, Isaiah 61, comes from the second section that we call the Book of Comfort. And probably, friends, written many years after Isaiah had died. Someone else from Isaiah's school of prophecy, we think probably wrote that second section, because it refers to so much that's happened after Isaiah's life. They are now in exile. They've lost everything. So does God still say, I'm coming to punish you? No, in the second section, God says, in your brokenness, I will come to save you. In your grieving, I will come to rescue you. In your needing to be restored and to have a hope given back to you, I will be there for you. I am coming to save you. I hope you get that picture. Because when Jesus stands up in the synagogue and he says, today this message is coming true. He is saying, I am that direct connection to God that you need to find healing and restoration. Today, what the book of Isaiah was talking about is taking place here, right in front of you. And he's saying, Jesus, like Isaiah said, the implication from Jesus is the only way to be restored and to be healed and to be made whole and to be set free is in this direct connection that I'm going to show you with God. Right? Right? Later on, we hear those words, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Amongst many other lessons, Jesus used to show this new understanding he was presenting to them. So in Isaiah's time, all right, and we need to hear this perhaps in our context today, in your place of pain, in the place where our communities and our country finds itself too, it's as if Isaiah is saying, listen, people, what you're needing for healing does not come from political allegiances. What you're needing for healing does not come from your private wealth or your public wealth, the wealth of the nation. What you're needing for healing doesn't come from pretending to do the right things in the temples, like sacrifice the animals and do all those things. The connection doesn't come from those things. What you're needing comes from an authentic and true connection to who God is. The only way you can get a new hope and a healing and your brokenness be restored is in the right relationship with God. We've said that already here. We believe that is the answer for our land. People's hearts must turn back to God. For our community 
people's hearts must turn back to God. And in our individual spaces, in our families, in our friendship circles, in our workplaces, people's hearts must turn back to God. And so Jesus aligns himself with that prophecy from Isaiah. That prophecy is now real, in person, stands here in front of you. So Jesus is saying, friends, to those there in his day, if you need to understand how God is going to work, God is going to come to desperate people. God is going to come to the broken people. And so he's saying, I am the prophet. I am the one anointed, filled with the Holy Spirit. I am the one qualified to do the work and speak the words of God, so I will preach and I will teach. He did all those things, did he not? Spoke prophetic words of a people. Anointedly, he healed the broken. He taught with such authority. The people said this, who is this man? He speaks with such authority. And he comes to be the good news. Troy spoke to us last week about the word meek. Can I remind you of that? He said, meekness does not mean weakness. And to be meek is to be humble in the right sense. To be there in the presence of God saying, God, I need you to fill me, to soak me in who you are so I can all, in all humility and strength soak those around me in who you are, right? Be used in the community around me. And so Jesus came to preach the good news. He came to the meek. He came to heal. He came to proclaim peace. He came to call out the peacemakers. Are there peacemakers here today? He came to call out the peacemakers. And he said the only way to move forward is this needing to connect with the Father through forgiveness. And then to bring comfort to all those who mourn. Obviously in Isaiah, those who are mourning that they've lost their land, they've lost their identity, they've lost their understanding of who they are. The mourning for us here today is those who feel they've lost everything. Lost someone they love. I read a very sad story this morning. Um, I use the news, believe it or not, I read the news as part of my devotion so I can pray for what I'm reading about. And there's this one very well-known uh, black journalist on News 24, very well-respected woman. And my heart got so sad. She was writing in her article, and you can go and find it if you follow News 24, about why she is emigrating from South Africa. And her, her clan home is in the Free State. Her family home is in Mangaung. And she outlines in her story why she can no longer stay in our country. She's lost hope as a black professional woman. And she's already, the paperwork is done. She's leaving. She's immigrating. So there's brokenness for all sorts of reasons. There's grieving in her letter. Go and read that. And God says, I come to all those who are broken. I come to bring comfort. I come to restore, to put together again with joy who they are. If I was brave enough, I would have little jars of olive oil here. And I would ask Derek and others called into the ministry, right, at the pastoral ministry, come and stand here with me and to rub our hands in the olive oil, then invite you to come forward and rub it all over your face, all over your head. Ah! That's the picture from Isaiah, friends. You Cover me with the anointing of your presence. In other words, I shine. You're not stand under these lights with oil on your face. You're going, to, you're going to shine brightly. Shining with joy. Do you get that picture? 
We need to shine with the, the joy of who God is. Gladness and beauty instead of ashes. The people in the day were walking around wearing sackcloth, hessian. We would, closest parallel for us today, hessian cloth, covered in the gray of ash. And so Jesus too is saying, the time for that sort of mourning is done, people. Life is here, hope is here, healing is here. God is here, in person, right here. Do you see? So the invitation to you is for healing. And yes, this is resurrection language, is it not? It's about healing and hope and new life. And so I'm going to ask our worship team to begin coming across now. But if I could leave you with a picture of what it means, I'm a very visual preacher in my preparation. Can you imagine the biggest volcano that we have? Anywhere on the planet. A huge, massive volcano. And we know what happens when volcanoes erupt, that they spout clouds of ash kilometers into the air, don't they? Toxic gases and fumes, those pyroplastic flows that come down and will melt and vaporize life in an instant. Now, can you imagine a volcano like that of nastiness? A volcano of everything that is wrong. And there's not just one volcano. There are many volcanoes of nastiness around our world. And people, for whatever reason, and governments, for whatever reason, and those in authority and leadership, many of them, are these volcanoes spouting this ash. Can you see the columns of ash, of hatred, of lifelessness, pumping all that junk over our world? And when you have that picture of a volcano, remember what looks, the villages look like nearby when that ash begins to settle. They are completely covered, are they not? Crops die. People lose their livelihood and their lives. Communities are closed forever and must move away. Is the world covered in ash at the moment? Because then Jesus says the good news is I come to do away with the ash and bring the joy of celebration and hope and life. I come to comfort you, Tim, yes, you, yes, community, yes, but in fact, I've come for the whole world. Time to extinguish the volcanoes of nastiness and hate, spewing ash. I hope that image helps you. And then to be the ones that shine light and hope and life into the world. That's why we're healing, having a healing service today. New beginnings. In Jesus' name. Amen. So come to us again, O oh God. Fill our prayers with power and our hearts with faith. We pray for every place in our world where the wounds of war have left their mark. In your mercy. Heal us, O oh God. We pray for every scar of hatred that remains in our nation. In your mercy, heal us, O oh God. We pray for every person who is sick in body, mind, or spirit. In your mercy, Heal us, O oh God. We pray for all who work for the healing of our world. In your mercy, heal us, O oh God. And so, Father, 
Let your healing flow among us and within us. For Christ's sake, amen. We say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The lion is the kingdom, power and the glory, forever and ever. Thank you for joining us in listening to this message. Please like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. In this way, you will be notified when the next message is available. Until next week, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace.